Hey everyone, welcome back to the roundup. I have got some brilliant stories. I mean, we even have uh, Valve setting a delicious honey trap. But first, let's talk about the Square Enix leadership change because, yeah, it's changing. Um, if their board has their way in May of 2023, Matsuda will be replaced by Takeshi Kiryu. Now, this is in itself fairly interesting because Matsuda has got himself um, quite out there right? He's had those yearly letters that are always talking about like Web3, emerging technologies, NFTs, right? All of that stuff. And that's meant that a lot of people have been pretty damn skeptical um, about him, skeptical about their, you know, their leadership. Don't worry though, you've still got plenty of reason. Now, the company's obviously changed massively, right? They've dispensed with a bunch of their Western studios and uh, yeah, Luminous are gone. That's the Forspoken people. We covered that in a video a little while ago. Also, there has been good news. I mean, let's just take a look at their net sales, right? So since Matsuda came in, they really, really have went up. And that's even with Square Enix having, of course, quite a lot of failures. I mean, you look at Forspoken, you look at Babylon's Fall, right? Like they have definitely taken their else. But if you were thinking, okay, great, look at this, the revenue's going up, we've got FF14, we've got FF16, everything's looking great. Oh, wow, new leadership, somebody who's not talking about web... Th no. No, absolutely not. So to actually get into this then, uh, here you started with the role of general manager, corporate planning division, which sounds absolutely thrilling. And he's only been there since June of 2020. Now, if you're thinking, wow, they've got successful games. They know what doesn't work. They know what does. NFT man's gone. Absolutely not the case. If anything, they didn't go hard enough in Web3 for what the board want. So apparently this whole thing is intended to reshape the management team with the goal of adopting ever-evolving technological innovations and maximizing the creativity of the company's group. So kind of interesting. And when we actually go in here, um, Kiryu's previous jobs uh, basically involved scouting of new and disruptive technologies, right? So this is basically the, the company was heavily, uh, heavily leveraged in NFTs, in Metaverse, in just a whole bunch of Web3 uh, tech, which does mean that, yes, they probably want to accelerate that. Here's what he said. First of all, I am myself in the position of chief strategy officer under Pre uh, President Matsuda. Um, and he goes on just saying the second reason is that I objectively believe that Web3 is a business that has the potential to lead us to the next stage of growth. So there you go. We would like to continue to promote the Web3 business. I mean, at that stage, it, or this stage, it is a question of what Web3 business. There isn't exactly much going on there. But um, I mean, they have a lot of legacy IP, right? And we all know that companies with legacy IP really do love cheaply cashing in on them. I don't have good feelings about this one, to be honest with you. Before we get to our next story, though, quick little bit of self-promo. Of course, The Pale Beyond is out. Here's a fascinating thing. After um, we issued a bunch of bug fixes, the things we only learned when the game went live, um, we've actually, this is what's fun, we can see the like cohort analysis of our reviews. So we were sitting at a 90% in Steam, then we were at 91, but of uh, the reviews in the last three days, they are actually sitting at 97, which uh, to us is really indicating that the progress that's been made on issues of UX and uh, bugs really like is paying off because now our like our new cohort of reviews are more like a 97 so i thought you'd find that little tidbit of information kind of interesting and of course if you want to check out the pale beyond our um survival narrative role-playing game then you can head up that link down below thus far people uh, sure are loving it and those launch quibbles have thankfully been worked out but okay, time for quite uh, quite a quibble. Now, this isn't really one that these companies are going to care about because it's not the largest amount of money, but it is that Sony are actually being forced to pay out for Electronic Arts' loot boxes in Austria. Yeah, so basically... FIFA loot boxes are in violation of Austrian gambling laws. Sony have got to pay up. There's a lawsuit um, that's basically been brought. Uh, more than a thousand FIFA users who have been in contact with the company with claims around 800 euro, though in some extreme cases up to 
85,000 euro. So uh, yes, that sure is some great recurring uh, user spending. Now, the reason here is that this stuff is in violation of the country's gambling laws. And they explain that this is because of the player's ability to sell cards on the secondary market, meaning it is possible to make a profit given the randomized items, uh, you know, that some of them do have uh, basically a financial value. Now, the courts determined, pending an appeal then, that Sony are going to have to pay 338 euro for each claimant. So not the largest amount of money, definitely an amount of money that Sony will be happy to sink. But the reason though why this is Sony and not Electronic Arts is that the claims were raised by PlayStation users who bought the purchases through the PlayStation Store, which means that they have a contract with Sony who sold the product, not EA, uh, who made the product. Now, that is a bloody interesting way for that to go. Now, this is, what, a 1,000 FIFA users, it's about 350 euro each. I mean, at the end of the day, that's not a massive amount of money to a company like Sony. But imagine if a larger territory was to uh, have something like this go down, right? Like, if this was, say, going down in the UK for FIFA, the football game, like that would be absolutely gargantuan. So a kind of fascinating story. I think we always like to see those loot boxes be a bit of an L. And why this is particularly notable to me is that it is Sony who are having to do the paying here. This means that, uh, well, in this case, it's the platform holder that is actually taking on that gambling risk. So now as a platform holder, they're maybe going to think about anywhere where there could be that like secondary market. Again, I think of a lot of the CSGO Lotto stuff where that was all just because the secondary market existed, uh, which Valve, you know, they tried to shut down, but uh, who really knows how successful all that was. To move on to another story, though, this is uh, this is a rough one for a game called Workers and Resources Soviet Republic. It's a city builder. It's been doing well enough on Steam. It's made by uh, Three Division, who are an indie team, right? So they make their uh, sort of Soviet-era city builder um, that is prioritizing literal resource management, ensuring that you've uh, mapped out the entire production line for every aspect of your industries. So yes, it is, uh, you know, that dream... Uh, planned economy uh, sort of fantasy that <laughs> this is what it is um now it's a bit more of a niche game right it's the sort of game that's going to have a pretty damn dedicated audience who's really going to vibe with it and enjoy what it does and uh that was all good until they actually got dmca and taken off steam but the reason why is kind of insane because basically um it's one of their own community what happened here is that this community member, right, they created a guide on Steam, like literally just a Steam guide called Cosmonaut Mode, right, where, and this guide is, it's just text, and the text said, right, try these rules, you'll have a harder game, I call it Cosmonaut Mode. Now, then 3 Division started to work on a realistic mode that ended up using quite a few of the same ideas. And then the person who made Cosmonaut Mode, which again, is not a mode that involved like actual, like, you know, lots of game development. It was just a Steam guide. They responded by uh, doing content strikes on one of the team's friendly uh, influencers on YouTube, as well as the studio's videos, reporting their website, getting that taken down, I assume with their hosting company, filing a DMCA with Steam, which, uh, again, with those DMCAs, it's one of those things, whenever it's filed, um, usually, like, whatever it is, will just get yanked, and then it will be sorted out later. Now, see yanking a game off Steam, because, of course, we just launched a game on Steam, I can talk to you a little bit about how that actually could be really brutal. Um, now, per 3 Division, uh, he claims to have created a published step-by-step uh, -step manual to modify and play uh, video games in an ultra-hard manner for a challenging and realistic game experience. Now, they contest that basically no development here was, like, done. This is just a guide for, I mean, a suggested way to play the game. Um, Three divisions said that if they, you know, the person had have just asked, they would have been very happy to work uh, with uh, that person. They actually said that they added him to the credits as a thanks for showing that people wanted this kind of mode. But now, of course, they're going to be a lot less willing to do that because the actions of this community member has caused them, you know, real financial harm, which when you're an indie studio who's got to keep the lights on is uh, not good. That said, one perhaps would hope that the, uh, you know, the, the attention brought on to this game by this uh, pretty malicious bullshit, uh, that that will make up for, uh, you know, for their lost revenue. But whatever happened with them even just saying to Kotaku, this is sad, which it is, uh, no, as of March 4th, game is back. Seemingly, 
it's fine. <laughs> so I guess some talk went on because I, I really do not think that, um, you know, that that person's uh, stuff would have really had much of a, a strong basis. So kind of insane. Being off Steam for a while, that can hurt. It can hurt momentum, right? It can hurt a lot of algorithm things that usually, you know, Valve will take as a signal. Um, that'll say like, hey, should we put this game in people's discovery queue? So anything that really messes around with your placement on Steam actually does cause like very real material harm. Pretty crazy situation. Now, another one, but it's not crazy, it's actually kind of expected, is Blumhouse. So Blumhouse, you know, they do make a lot of movies in the horror genre. Sometimes people just think, oh, Blumhouse, that's a lot of trash. No, not really. I mean, actually, Blumhouse have put out loads of really big hits. You've got like The Purge, uh, Get Out, which, you know, like that was brilliant. Uh, Happy Death Day, Megan, and quite a lot of other like surprisingly good movies. Um, they just put out like about, you know, I'd say at least three movies um, a year. And now they're moving into the game space, right? They're going to be a publisher in games. Now, They've already actually got a film in production for both Five Nights at Freddy's and for Dead by Daylight. Um, and now they're going to be working with horror titles for console mobile PC with a budget of under $10 million. $10 million really does go quite a long way. So uh, actually, that, yeah, this could see loads of, I don't want to say like full double A, but this could basically see a lot of horror projects uh, existing, which is certainly going to be good for fans of the horror genre. Again, if Blumhouse, if they... If they run their game strategy in any way similar to their film strategy, probably a decent amount of new horror games uh, on the way. And when you look into the talent behind this, as an example, you've got the president, Zach Wood of Iron Galaxy, Arcane Studios, Santa Monica Studio. We've got Don um, Sackler, who was a Sony VP of Global Business Operations Planning and Strategy for nine years. So there, there you have it. One of the things we've noticed is that Steam has just had a healthy horror genre for uh, for several years now um i suppose they're probably going to look at that and think okay which of these teams do we just pick up and give a load of gas? Um, as Mike Bithell, who I think most people will know from Thomas Was Alone, he's done a hell of a lot more since, um, like the, the John Wick game, which I thought was particularly cool. Uh, Blumhouse moving into games is super smart, can totally see a lot of their philosophy and approach mapping well into this industry, especially at the indie end of the spectrum they are targeting. Cool that studios are looking at games, cooler that they're looking at smaller games. Absolutely, because smaller games can fit into those nice little niches and cracks that help those games be truly special to us. And and finally, we have got being owned by Gaben. Yes, we do have a, uh, we have a honey trap. Okay, so how do you catch 40,000 cheaters at once and delete them? Well, here's, here's what you do. If you're Valve, you set a trap for them. Uh, they basically found a fix for a piece of software that was allowing people to access information that would not usually be available. But before they closed, closed the loop entirely, they released the patch. Now this patch sequestered that information such that players could never access it during normal gameplay, thereby meaning the only way to access that information would be via the cheats. And then Val were able to basically just run their checks and identify 40,000 people who had accessed that data and uh, just ban them. They felt pretty damn confident about upholding those bans. It does mean that if you look at the Steam forums for Dota 2, there's a lot of people complaining they've been unfairly banned. That's where it's tricky because with any large action like 40,000 cheaters, you could definitely imagine a few people uh, slipping through the cracks. Um, but also, this kind of does happen a lot with band waves. I think a lot of people sometimes just sort of think, yeah, we can, we can cheat. It's fine. The consequences won't apply to me. Uh, and then, no, you fall straight into a honey trap. So, I suppose, well done, Valve. It's always fun to see the people who genuinely come in and ruin our game experiences, uh, you know, get, get owned. So with them being owned, that's it for today's video. Of course, we will have much more content. Um, now that the Pale Beyond is out and we're able to like collect ourselves a little bit, um, there's a lot of news to hop into. I mean, man, stuff is really heating up with the CMA, the amount of mud that's being slung everywhere. So I cannot wait to get into that. But for now, everyone, have a brilliant day and I'll see you tomorrow.